three takes to make sound emissions. We're going to start with applicant 102317. <laughs> 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 Okay. So, uh, this individual is coming from Washington. I noticed that their first exam was in 2018, and then after that, they can not test again until through 2022. They had one study review on 914 2022, and that's why it's being brought to you now. Prior to moving on to the, they tested six months prior to moving on to the seven. So, either another study review or additional training. Yeah. This is this is tricy. I, I mean, I'd love to. I, what I'm noticing is that their study review was in September, and then they did not retest again until February. So I don't know how helpful the study session was. So I mean, if, if we could make it so that their study session was right before they took an exam again, that I think would be beneficial for them. Yeah, and that's what we do try to do. We try to schedule the same day, so that's early in the morning, so they have plenty of time. Right. Okay, we'll do another study review. Okay. Applicant one two nine nine five six. Again, they started in two thousand eighteen. Tested a couple times in two thousand nineteen. And then 2020, three times, but they did not come back until 2023 to retest. <laughs> and they got a 71% last time they tested. And it says that they received additional training three different times. Do we know what that involved? So they didn't receive three different times. They had to take a practical in 2018 to be able to test. Okay. And then one study review. Um, God, thank you for the the shock to expire. And they were pretty close, yes. So if we get them in prior to their practical um, expiring again, they do. Did they expire twice? About to. Uh, yes. So in 18, 18, 21, they took a practical they'll have until 8, 9, 23 of this year before they have to reach up. A practical again. So we would recommend a study review before they take the next one. Yeah. Yeah. He's close. They're really close. The applicant's close. Next applicant, one three two two seven one. Started in again two thousand nineteen. Um, tested twice in 20, twice in 21, one in 22, and did not come back again until this year. They've had two study reviews at hour each, but once again, they never tested. They only tested one time after their study review in 21. This is Chelsea. The dates, though, for the study reviews are the same as that test date next to it. Yes. So would it have been the same day or would it have been like? No, same day. It would have been Okay. So in, they got a 71% after the study review in 21. 69% after the study review yes. in 23. It's just encouraging them to get right back in and yeah. instead of waiting a year apart. You know, before they tough again, it's the biggest thing. 
and you know they could have other jobs or things that they're doing and not being able to get back in, or they live a long ways away. I'm not opposed to one more study review for them. They're very close as well. A longer study review, yes. Um, the next applicant, one four seven on eight seven. Their practical will expire on seven two. Again, they haven't tested since March of twenty two. They've had one steady review and a practical on twenty one. You know, this is this is Tracy. Just a question: When when we see that they tested March of twenty twenty two. If it's just now coming in front of us, does that mean that they have applied to test again? And that's why it's coming in front of us. So they're anticipating testing again right now. Correct. Right. <clears throat> so it's been a year. So for this one, additional hours and a license per year would be something that I would rather have just because. When I'm looking at this, I'm thinking it's been a year that they've tested. How serious seat is this applicant about going into, into this profession? Well, the form of like the same too, like the, uh, the scores. The scores. Yeah, um, I know. Involved. Yeah, and that that's that's my that's my second point. My second point is is how serious and also take a look at the score. So I would recommend. Uh, like I said, additional hours than a licensed career school. We don't need to be consistent all the way across the board on how many times we allow some kind of study session and then retesting. We can suggest the hours or require the hours at different testing intervals for people or attempts for people. Yeah, was there any accommodation for this person? No. I would fill it in their folder. Yeah, so um, there, another thing is they did have passed their loss and rules. Uh, in October of last year. So in between testing for the um, nail, they were also testing for loss and goals. So they did pass their loss and goals. So they only have, yeah, they only have until 7 2 to pass this without having to go back and take a practical and not only take a um, practical, it's going to depend if they repay their application fee prior to them having to retake the loss of rules again. Right. So I don't need back to school just yet. It may be a clock out for yeah. them. So okay, so a study session. Study study session. Yeah, yeah. Let's do a study. That's generally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, they have to vote. All someone wants to call them together or This is Chelsea Winscott. I make a motion to vote in favor of the recommendations for the applicants. 
This is your opponent dissected that version. Nick Roll, Tracy Fromu, yay. Chelsea Westcott, yay. Beatrice Spann, yay. Carol Folks, yay. Jamie Barron, yay. Ken. All right. Um, this is Robert Waffle, Chair Members of the Board, Director of Reports. Um, so in your books behind tab seven on the third page, those uh, the board's standing as far as uh, their status as uh, being on the board. Um, Tracy, the chair is in her first full term and it expires October 16 of this year and you can reappoint. I mean, when uh, her term expired, 12, 31, 22, um, the, I would imagine is uh, in the process of getting extended into the second term. Amy Farron is in her first term and the term will expire November 9, 2026 with Henry Point, Chelsea Westcott's first term as well. Term expires June 29 of 2026, and you can reappoint Beatrice Band. <clears throat> excuse me, it's still in your first term. It expires January 25th, 2028. And Carol, you are in your second term, and that expires April 24, 2027. And you cannot report. But the name is spelled wrong, so I, I can't. <laughs> I can't. I don't know who that girl Fountain is. <laughs> I will we'll talk to you. <laughs> um, next will be the uh, fiscal report. Excuse me. So this broke out by quarter, by fiscal year. Those two members that are new to the board fiscal year within the state government starts July 1 until June 30. Thank you, I need to list. So, currently, um, fiscal year 2023, um, quarter four, we've had 38 licenses issued for bar. Next page, the hair design. Got 104 licenses issued. Hill technology, quarter four, we've had 104 licenses issued. Um, just a note, we are still in quarter, so what you look like you're trending in the moment. Um, the National Air Care. For the team license and training report. As officials, we issued 268 licenses and two appears to be training report. Any contractors for 204 freelance authorizations and 404 safety licenses. Cosmetology facility, we've issued 164 questions on the license. Renewables um, had a total of 81 renewed online, 72 on paper. Probably the goals are. Time and paper and green. Um, and that was in quarter four. Hair design, they're getting it 730 of renewed online, uh, 552 have renewed by paper. Uh, nail technology, they're really getting it 628 have renewed online with 309. Natural hair care as well, seven. Renewed online to uh, by paper. 
estheticians, they get it as well. 661 renew online. 363 renewed by paper. Independent contractors, 56 renewed online, each renewed by paper. And freelance authorization, we're working on it. 25 are renewed online and on paper. Cosmetology facilities, 385 have renewed online, 206 by paper. Licenses by age and gender. Those that uh, identify as female appears to be with both the this is my profession. Licensing trend for bartering. You can see it has a downward trend, but we're still in four to four, so it looks like it being four to four it is improving. 787. Hair design, same, um, but it looks like they're improving in the four to four with 19,721. Nail technology as well appears to be improving in four to four, 12,666. Natural hair care, they've improved over the last two years. In Here's somewhat static at 165 to 44. That could improve. License decisions. They're improving at uh, 15,168 to 44. Independent contractors. They took a a little bit of a dip, but looks like they're on the way up and improving at 7,390.44. Freelance authorizations improving dramatically. 44 to 603 from 77. facilities have improved since quarter two of fiscal year 2022, standing now in quarter four of Fiscal year 2023 at 4,875. Any questions on those? Next, we have our testing results. So, the time of the report, our time I received the report. Again, um, have been a couple of weeks, so they could at least test scores could have improved. Or the testing could have improved all the way down. Any questions on the test? Okay. Now the big picture. Um, your financials are still in the negative, but we've improved. The board itself has improved with the um, the increases, and uh, currently standing at six hundred and twenty-six thousand arrears. But that's an improvement of two hundred thousand ish from the previous um, fiscal year. Any questions on this? All right. Moving on. And with the regulatory report, I would do that for Francis since he's not here. Back at the HLO holding down the board. <clears throat> um, there's one case that appears to be outstanding, but that's something in the back of my mind is telling me he told me it was closed. So I believe it is. Carrie's over the shape. Thank you, Carrie. Um, from 2021, there's 48 outstanding cases. I'm sorry, excuse me. That is correct. Um, in 2023, there's 150, <coughs> excuse me, open cases for a total of 199. 
And that's all across the spectrum of all the cosmetology licensees facilities and unlicensed. And you can see that here's some of the larger numbers that we have. Any questions or concerns about the regulatory reporting? Ms. Tracy, what is the like what is the what is the what closes the case for an unlicensed cosmetology? Like you just like determine no, they're not licensed, the fees or what actually closes the case on that? We so after the investigation, we'll issue a notice um, for civil penalty at that point, typically closed. Um, and sometimes they weren't actually, they, we find that they were actually licensed, but the complaint came in as unlicensed, but uh, those are far and few between. But we do have those that are unlicensed, then we do issue some of the penalty. Are both of those people, like, people that have been licensed to their states that have been, like, transferred things over, or are they just operating? Someone got some practice somewhere, okay. and, um, and was, was practicing without a license, but it, it could be, I couldn't say, but um, being the former regulatory manager, it was a lot of, um, yeah, my license expired. I don't have time to go get it, so I need to make some money to know what I'm doing, what I do. So I cut hair and emails, whatever. Thank you. All right. Yeah, but had enough of Sammy, there's some more. They fall through my door. You don't have the legislative assembly. It's more of the So, um, there is on 2048, which is, no, yes, 2048, which is issuing the original registration with the applicants for behavioral analysis and that shows. There is an update to House Bill 2048, which directs the Health House Banking Office to issue provisional registrations to applicants for behavior analysis intervention registration. Um, they went to the Ways and Needs of Committee and Human Services. They passed it out of committee to back to the Full Committee of Ways and Means, and then the Full Committee of Ways and Means held a work session and passed it out for due pass recommendation of amendments and others that to be in gross version. I can't remember what that should be about. Um, the be in gross, what they had done, and this has nothing to do with the board, um, what they were mentioned, it's not only did they want each of those to issue a license to interventionists within a five day period, they in the A gross, they wanted us to do the some, some research to figure out a way to bring more intervention interventionist practitioners into the field. The B took that out. So we're back to issues by five days once we have a completed application. Okay, next. Um, next one is related to. Temporary staffing agency. So, 2022, HLO, uh, um, the bill was passed where HLO was signed to issue authorizations to temporary staffing agencies, and that was for medical. And um, July 1, here in a few weeks, it goes live, and it's a requirement where um, anybody who as temporary staff working in Oregon, that agency or that office on temporary staffing have to have an authorization. So, um, HLO did, um, and some of you may recall, we did this um, for advanced aesthetics. Yeah. Um, waiver or because it, it goes live and we can't release the rules until July, just for July 1. And so July 1 is the date you have to have your license. So we gave them a waiver for 90 days to 
you know, being together to provide each other a complete application package. And it's pretty extensive. I won't go into details on that. But for them to get the application to us, for us to vet the um, people who operate the temporary staffing agency and issue that license or authorization. The next one is House Bill 2696. Yeah. Excuse me, can I, can I just ask a question? This is your and it's in regards to <laughs> the temporary medical. So uh, is it my understanding that they are going to have any entity that has a staffing agency is going to have to register in the state of Oregon to do business in the state of Oregon? Right. And so there are, are there any price caps on their services? That's uh, a great question. You know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so there is a bill two six six two six six five. Let me see what it is, and um, it is on law yet. So all I can say. Yeah. Why we just two six six? But it's basically it's going to be price caps. Right cap. We tried that once already, and they had a big to do and committee. Oh yeah. So yeah, I mean, so we're talking we're early, early on from 2022. Um, OHA had to bring on a third party to do research as to what those rate, rate caps would be, not what they would be, but how to get to it and things to take into account while setting it. Well. They were figuring out how to say, set the rate caps because you've got all kinds of dynamics. You've got rural density populations, you name it, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, there is a department within the health authority that is going to do that. It's Senate Bill 2665 as well. And that will include the rate. Got it. I, I feel that that was coming. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I, for the life of me right now, I'm trying to think what the last session of, I watched was what happened, but I, I don't remember exactly where they are. It looks like it's going to pass. I can tell you. Well, it passed out of the house door. How about sending it to me? No, you're not. <laughs> so yeah, it's passed out of that. Thank you for the update. I appreciate it. I you know, didn't help care. Thank you. <clears throat> Next one is a House Bill 2696, which creates the signing language and board um, to the Health Health Housekeeping Office. It will be a number seven or nine. Seven. And two have uh, Yeah, so the house, uh, the always means committee voted in out of out of the big house for the A verse 13. Yes. And then it went to the house floor in past. So now we're still using because I went to the joint meeting, so it doesn't have to go past or out. So we'll see. And that one is for you, that one in 2665. I mean, they're steaming along, so it's just kind of a wake up. They want them to go past. Just, what that would do is add uh, six. Additional points types of license at each other. And I'm sure all that you guys will wait for is Senate Bill 217, um, which is the bill that originally was going to move the curriculum from the Higher Education Coordinating Commission to the Board of Cosmetology. Um, and that bill was steaming along really well. Um, we had 
one uh, amendment originally, which was the one which had added country into the group of people who we could look at for a license for license in their state, state or country. And then there was an additional amendment adding exempting anybody who was doing airbrush training from the status of the practice, exempting the interpretation. And then there were several changes made, additions made in regards to the curriculum. So it would require, it was going to require curriculum committee needs to of school owners, school representatives to meet before any curriculum was changed in the rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's two school representatives to the board took away, let's see, one had to be a practitioner and one had, one had to be a competency school. And either one of those two would be not. They didn't change your makeup, it's still set. Um, so, but one could be not present, it's still a school. Um, it did a few other things, like said HLO can't um, cite schools for anything, which because it was removing that requirement of us inspecting schools, but it's stuck in uh it's no easy thing to wait. It's just stuck in just keeps waiting to be. Um, good. I'll report back. Okay. I think it passed here. Yeah. Hold on. Just a second. Oh, I'll um, Okay. <laughs> I would be thinking of other stuff. Um, looks like it may have passed. So. We'll see. We'll see. Um, and that's the only other one was um, having the dental lab program, but that hasn't been left as a new So, yes, you can get signed to it. So, that one. Oh, the study comes back. We could have the. Um, Changes to 2665, 2048, and potentially, I don't know what you're doing. Just wait until I will send you an update of our Any special items about 2017? Okay, that's all I have now. Next on the Uh, okay, at this time, the Board of Cosmetology will hear public interested parties feedback. Members of the public, this meeting is being held by MS Teams video conference and is being recorded. The recording will be posted to the internet for public viewing. Please be sure to mute your microphone and unmute only when you have been recognized. Once recognized, please state your name and affiliation to the board for the record. Nice. <clears throat> 
Tracy Strauss, Karen Dashman, Bill, Brenda, Becky, Joe, Um, actually, I just wanted to read something because I'm, I'm really concerned about um, the vote that went on yesterday after I cut the heat um, concerning micro needling being moved uh, into the advanced aesthetics domain of the fleet. So I'm just going to leave the glasses back on. Hold on. Yeah. I'm not enough anyway. All right. Um, first off, my name is Brenda Satchel. I've been licensed in Oregon since 1990. Um, I have 33 years experience in aesthetics. Um, I've been a full cosmetologist. I've been an educator for seven years. I've participated as the director of education for three years. I've been an advanced skin trainer. Um, now I do my private spa. This year I was finally able to even hire my first employee. Um, these last five years going through, you know, with uh, Bill 2970 and all the changes has been exceptionally difficult. I'm all facing that position. Um, so it's really sad to be back here again, standing up trying to defend. Okay. Um, first off, I agree with Rule 2970, and as it states, as petitions is limited, is limited to performing services. As an institution, you know, we're limited to performing services with any of mechanical or electrical apparatus, appliance, or device that do not penetrate beyond the epidermis, except in natural physiological tests. Okay. Second step, um, the institutions may use a mechanical or electrical apparatus, appliance, or device that include, but not limited to. Your galvanic, your high frequency, and microcurrent, your um, LED, microdermal, and so on. Um, they're used for the purpose of cleansing, stimulating, manipulating, and exfoliating in product application. Um, Microneedling really fits into this category. And there is no risk factor compared to a laser, which I hear was stated yesterday. I've been doing microneedling off and on for over 10 years, and there's other estheticians that have been doing it even longer. There's no complaint. In the state of Oregon, for us to do and continue microneedling. And according to your own flow chart, microneedling fix for basic esthetician. So I really don't understand yesterday's vote. Um, as an educator, a trainer, or practitioner, I assure you there's no more risk with microneedling the epidermis versus microderm abrasion or galvanic on the epidermis. Again, we've been practicing microneedling for over a decade without a single complaint being filed. There is no justification for removal for microneedling from basic institutions. As an educator, a trainer, a practitioner, an employer, I'm deeply concerned that the subject will even be brought to the forefront by the advanced aesthetic board. Um, let's see. Compared to um, Sorry, um, who compared microneedling from what I heard to laser? Um, it could not be further from the truth. The risk factor for microneedling again is no higher than microderm or galvanic. I've been there for 33 years. I've seen what people can do with microderm alone when they don't do it correctly. Um, it's no higher of a risk, I guarantee you guys. Okay, now the negative financial impact that you're going to. Um, Bread from the basic estheticians, their family, all throughout Oregon, um, and top it off during the recession. We're already having a hard time being in. Um, I myself will lose a quarter of my income. Um, we have thousands of dollars from investing in needles, the tools, the training, and the supplies. I may have to lay off my employee. About $20,000 a year. I can't afford to keep an employee in the best position. Right. Okay. Um, I guarantee you all the basics that estheticians here in Oregon, they're watching, they're getting a little bit, they're not happy. They feel more than confident to make that risk assessment and maintain it in the basic aesthetics department. So I hope you guys will seriously reconsider and actually do some fact checking and evaluate the true risk factor. Um, I guess your own committee, your RAC, 
it is unanimous. They actually support maintaining microneedling within your aesthetics, the basic aesthetics. So I think some reevaluation is really the Thank you. Can I say one thing? Um, I encourage everybody to go and listen to the recordings of all these, including those rides. Um, also, August 15th, August 1st, September 15th, is a public comment. So, everything you said today, I encourage you to write it down, send it to me via email, uh, or come to the hearing. All on it. It was August 15th, you said that one? I believe it's 16th. I'll check. Yeah, I see an August 16th here for hearing. Yeah. 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 So you can come to that, you can call in. And it's all day, so whatever time's convenient for you. But just the one you think is the no, end no. of today. Yeah. Okay. Before we're opening the discussion, I just want people to understand the truth implications and the risk factor. And be sure to listen to those rules advice Yeah. Next one. Good afternoon. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Deborah Manston. I am a certified advanced esthetician as well as an instructor. I have served, as you are serving, for two terms on this board. I've served for years on various advisory committees as far as education, and I just served on the ground as well um, for separating scopes and practice. I do teach my training as a seat for both advanced and basic estheticians. I spoke yesterday, I was very upset um, hearing the discussion based on a comparison to laser and light base and that CAE actually basically claimed that device for an advanced scope. I brought today a microneedling um, tip for you to look at and you can see compared to the risk factors to eyes and skin, microneedling is very benign, especially when done in the epidermis as it should be done to um, for the basic scope of practice. I want you to take a look at these as you consider the risk factors when uh, you're comparing them to what those other devices do in the advanced tier. I um, believe that this was done very hastily. I think, I think that it was influenced by those CAEs on the board that um, have financial gain possibly for keeping the um, microneedling into the advanced scope. It is a very lucrative service and many of our basic estheticians will lose a lot of money not being able to offer this to their clients. We're not seeing complaints. If we were seeing problems with this service, we would have many complaints coming in. I have served as subject matter expert as well on this for this board. And I know that we would definitely see problems coming from this service as we did with laser and light. Um, I would encourage you to please Consider who you represent, which is the basic estheticians uh, of the state. And the reason that we're in this situation where we had to go back to the legislature, I sat with Sandy and wrote to help to write this bill. We wrote it so that we could protect the devices and keep our scope open and make this fair for all estheticians. And we don't want that to change. And we hope that you will represent the estheticians for again and um, make decisions that are thoughtful and educated about the devices and the services that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I spoke yesterday. My name is Whitney Barrier, and I was on the rack, so I feel very, very passionate about them. That's why I even joined. I'm a busy businesswoman. It's not like I have tons of extra time just to be on these kinds of boards. It's completely voluntary. I did it because I want us to be in a state that um, doesn't over-regulate and constantly change things. When you're receiving a license, you're going to school, you're promised that you can do this, and then all of a sudden, within months, suddenly you can't do it. It's very, very stressful. It makes going to school worthless. It makes your curriculum worthless, what the state promised, it's worthless because now we're sitting here working in the way that we've been told that we should do it, right? Within reason, it's always within reason. That's why we have a separation now between advanced and basic. 
I am going to be attending advanced school this year. I'm already enrolled. So it's not, I support both, right? And I see value in both, but that doesn't devalue one. And I see a big devaluing of the basic license. And I don't think that's right. And I think people really need to be more educated because I don't understand why no one even talks about the nano. And I have great evidence already. You know, it's being taught in schools. I think you guys don't even know what that looks like. So making massive decisions that make massive financial impact for really no risk factor, I think is really, really wrong. And the minute I got home, I was all over the aesthetic network. People were angry. I think you guys, it's going to be a very upsetting thing because we're talking about a service in the basic level that is still one of their top tier services. So it's not like, oh, you can't double cleanse anyone anymore. What people are paying for top dollar for all our basic is going to be microneedling for the top tier services. So that's the most expensive service that we take it. Their financial loss is going to be massive. They also are some of the most expensive devices. If you're getting a correct FDA, you know, registered and approved device and you're being trained properly and you're getting the correct tips so that your client is safe, you're investing thousands of dollars. So you have to be really realistic when you just wipe something away and just to sit here and suddenly vote on the pressure of incorrect information saying it's so dangerous that you're going to basically die of infection when in our own curriculum is basic, we already have to be trained on how to deal with blood. Do you think our clients don't clean? They go over like a, you know, come down and then all of a sudden you start to bleed on You've got to deal with it. You've got to deal with the stuff that's touched it. You've got to deal with it properly. We're going to be on a test. How to deal with blood. When you do an extraction, they always bleed. <laughs> you don't want them to, but they will. You can put the needle on something that's inflamed. So to say that we've never even been introduced to how to deal with blood, and typically, if we're talking about external microneedling, your client is probably not bleeding anyway. That's the reality. So. I just think it's really, really, really important to be very careful with back decisions. And as people who I can tell are sitting on board who aren't sure, should go home and say, I am not sure. I need to learn more before making a massive decision. So I was a little disappointed with yesterday because I saw that like three people were very sure and no one else was. And then everyone went with it. So I think as a board representing all of us, that's not the right way to do it. Melissa Lewis, do you have comments? Melissa Lewis? Brenda Clayton, do you have comments? We needed to wear, we have to end with them. They need to meet themselves. Is anybody on the line? On the conference line? She was on, so she may have to know. So, yeah, I have a comment. And there's that. This is Olivia Nelson. Go ahead, Olivia. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to um, say thank you to everybody for spending your time doing this. And I also just agree with um, the other women who just spoke. Um, and I wanted to also add that I just would like you to consider possibly instead of putting microneedling into advanced, to just require the additional hours um, of education, like you guys did for chemical peels and um, dermaplaning. Um, I heard it said yesterday that um, one of the reasons microneedling was going to go into the advanced scope was because it punctures the skin. But today, in the rules, the implement 
listed. One of them is a lancet and that punctures the skin. So it just seems very inconsistent. And um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of echo what everybody else said. And it's gonna, it's gonna be a big financial um, concern for, for estheticians. So I just wanna ask that you consider instead of moving it to advanced to just um, add the additional hours. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to make a comment? Is that a hand up? Yes, Dr. Brenda. Brenda Lynch. Hello, this is Brenda. Can you hear me? Yes. Is it is it okay? Do I still have a minute to talk? Yes, you do. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. I was having terrible time joining with you guys. I'm glad. Um, I just wanted to address the board. Thank you for uh, letting allowing me to talk. Um, I am, of course, one of the estheticians that have been licensed actively for 38 years. I also was very active with the Oregon. Uh, estheticians for fair licensing and I want to tell you as a business owner I have spent hundreds if not thousands of dollars working with legislation going through all the hoops and bells since this was changed when the advanced estheticians board came about it was because of lasering so safety for lasering so all of us old timers who had been in our scope of practice, I don't care about lasering because I don't have the thousands of dollars in a medical spa to do that. But I do care about our scope of practice like germ abrasion and microneedling. So my microneedling equ equipment is, is high end. It was $2,000. Um, I'm professionally trained. I'm professionally certified to do those things. And I am just very concerned about how our scope of practice is being affected when we went through all the trouble of hiring a lobbyist to have clarity and the governor signed off. I was with the legislature when they came back to um, Oregon Estheticians for Fair Licensing and say, okay, we won this. And then we've had these subcommittees, which I tried to be a part of. Um, I never got any response back on that. Um, and, and now arbitrarily, I understand that this will go away again. And women in this industry are the dominant. There's more women in the industry, but we continue to be up against it. And as a small business owner, we cannot afford to continue hire, hiring lobbyists for our scope of practice. So I encourage the boards to go back, to look at what the governor said was within our scope of practice, all of the board members on both of the advanced and the regular, and to look at these things that kids are going to school for, that people have spent thousands of dollars to get certified in, and really make some logical decisions. Because at the end of the day, it's about the consumer's health. And you can, you can buy microneedling pens on Amazon. And people are going to do it themselves. So let's have some common sense to our scope of practice. Yes, the bottom line and the principle is that we don't hurt the public. That is the principle. That's what we stand for. And also I want to say, um, so, you know, ending period there, the next thing I want to say is that we pay a lot of money for our license, 40% more than what we used to play, pay. And it is very hard to, uh, to get emails returned. It is very hard to reach people when we're trying to. And our State Board of Cosmetology, you guys are it for us. You're the people who we reach out to when we have questions, when we have concerns about things. And you can be in 10 different social media groups about estheticians and you're gonna get 10 different answers on things. We need to have some clarity and some clear communication. Uh, that goes out to all of our licensed professionals. And we just need to be better at it. We used to be a lot better at it, and we're not anymore. It's convoluted, people are fighting, people are disagreeing with things. Our laws need to be so clear that anybody can understand them. And people coming from other states and even other countries coming to Oregon, they should have an easy approach to their licensure. It shouldn't be this hard. Um, 
what we had before, why we added additional board. Again, it all is because of health and safety of the consumer. So we need to make good choices. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Email to read. This is directed to April. Uh, thank you for allowing me to wrap something about my concerns. I moved from California in 2016 to Oregon. I was working as a medical esthetician in California since 2010. I was told I would need to get my advanced license to do what I did in California as an Oregon esthetician. My husband stayed in California while I was here alone going to school. This expense and being alone knowing no one in Oregon was a very difficult time for us both, both physically and emotionally. My point is that why does an esthetician deserve to do advanced treatments like micro needling without putting in the time, money, and effort that an advanced esthetician has to do? This is a slap in the face to us. If an esthetician wants to do advanced esthetician treatments, they need to do it the way I and others have had to do it. Education. I am sure I speak for other advanced aesthetic estheticians like myself. Thank you for hearing my concerns. Best, Alicia. Is there any additional board business? Um, we have one more person. Sorry, she just um, Lane Lawless. I to speak. Lane Lawless. Lane Lawless, do you have a comment? Oh, do you see your people? I don't know what phone number. Uh, I asked just like the following email. Did she email you? Oh, I'm so. You're not seeing it on She on this phone, Nate? No, she's not interested. There's nobody on the conference line, so. Not the conference line. There's yeah, no, the conference. no, that's what I mean. There's no one on that at all. Like the one we use at the office, there's no. Yeah, she's not one thing. Yeah, I mean. From her emails, it sounded like she's kind of going between MS Teams because she was having a hard time hearing, and then the phone, but then she was having a hard time hearing. Elaine, are you there? Okay. Well, we're going to give you some volume. Just one second. 
Go ahead. Hold on a second, we're going to do a microphone for you. Hold on. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to take a picture like this. Um, we read, I'm sorry, but I said, um, the education team. Make sure that the school for practice was there. Um, I am very surprised that one other form of security, there are no regular institutions. Um, so I would find that there is a kind of disconnect between our profession and our board. Uh, they were saying that was said today about, um, you know, basically making a certain notes and all sorts of things about what we need to do when we do mash painting and this is our condition with not the chemicals. Um, there's actually nothing that the air director or male position needs to be done. So to recognize that it is sufficient that knows what it is on a daily basis to kind of uh, lose you know, some realistic expectations and the rules. And then, you know, one of the things we fought for it was to be able to work in the epidermis. Um, um, one of the uh, two ways they make my position, and unfortunately, it was removed. But what it can be done in the epidermis, or if it's done in the dermis, you actually do. So it's very easy to know that you're not in the epidermis. So I feel there is. Is there any other board business? Uh, the Board of Cosmetology meeting is adjourned at 1.06 p.m.